Hello, my friends. It's Nick. It's the ASMR nerd. And today I've got a really simple, unpretentious video planned. And actually, it's one of the more commonly requested videos on the channel here. Today, I'm going to be trying out some beers, doing a beer tasting. And those of you who've been around the channel for a while might know that I really enjoy craft beers. I like trying out new and interesting craft brews, the ones that are sort of different and stand out from the crowd a little bit. You might know I've done a few of these videos in past, and if you come out to my regular streams, whether here on YouTube or on Twitch, I stream in both places, you might know that I like to try a new beer with every live stream. It's sort of a ritual, the beer pour every stream, but it's not that often that I do videos of beer tastings here on the YouTube channel. And so I thought it was high time to do one. Today I've got three interesting looking beers that I've never tried before, all from local craft breweries from around my area in Western Canada. And we are blessed here with an abundance of uh, really good craft breweries with all kinds of interesting and exciting different kinds of beers to try and new ones releasing all the time. So uh, I am never lacking for variety. So that's the plan today. I'll try each of these out. In turn, I will let you know what I think about them, how they taste and smell and all that. And we'll probably just shoot the breeze along the way, you know, ramble about some stuff, maybe video games. That's kind of what we talk about around here a lot. And uh, I think it's going to be, it's going to be nice. It's going to be casual. It's just going to be you and me and these three delicious looking beers and this beautiful graphic tea from this video sponsor into the AM. Hold on a second. Wait. This isn't a graphic tea. <laughs> this is a polo. This is a polo. Do you mean to tell me that into the AM purveyors of elevated everyday apparel known far and wide for their beautiful, bold, vibrant graphic tees? are selling buttoned-up polos? Huh. Yeah, I guess so. As a matter of fact, Into the AM tells me that their polos are some of their best sellers. Who would have guessed? Now, I must admit that historically, I've not been much of a polo guy. They're just not really my style, but I gotta say that this polo is doing a lot of work to convince me otherwise, because like all of Into the AM's clothing, it is incredibly comfortable, like super duper soft, like, like wearing a cloud. <laughs> if, you know, cloud was a little more able to cover you up. Uh, really easy to care for. I just threw this in the washer, threw it in the dryer, came out perfect. They're pre-shrunk, so you don't have to worry about that. They're really nicely fitted. I think this thing looks really good, uh, despite not being a big polo guy. Uh, I think it actually looks really sharp, and if you want to elevate your apparel a little bit, you want something that looks just a little bit more buttoned up than a graphic tee. These things 
are fantastic. They're, like I said, really nicely cut, nicely fitted. They got this flattering kind of look. Uh, I'm really, really enjoying it. And they come in a whole variety of tasteful, uh, easy on the eyes colors. And not only that, friends, not only that, you can bundle them up to save when you buy multiple together. And you can even save an additional 10% of your entire order using the link down below at the top of the video description. 10% off whatever you order, whether it's polos like this, whether it's Into the AM's acclaimed graphic tees, which you know I love oh so much, whether it's their joggers, which I'm also wearing on my bottom half right now. You'll just have to take my word for that. Whether it's their underwear, their beanies, their hoodies, uh, whatever. They've got all kinds of stuff these days. Flannels, button-up shirts, it runs the gamut. Whatever you're looking for, they got it for you. All of it, super comfy, super easy to care for, and looks fantastic. And all of it is available for 10% off using that link down there. And when you do use that link, you'll also be supporting myself and this channel as well. Many of you have already done so. I appreciate it so very much. I get comments from you guys all the time, how much you love your Into the AM stuff just as much as I do. And of course, if you do go and check it out and you do use that link, I am so very grateful. Thank you so much for doing so supporting this channel and also a big thank you to into the am and their swanky new polos for sponsoring today's video and with that being said i think it's time to get into tasting some beers what do you think oh actually one more thing before i dive in i like to say this just ahead of every one of these beer tasting videos. And that is that I am a strong advocate for responsible alcohol consumption. And as time goes on, we are learning more and more that there really is no safe level of alcohol consumption. Alcohol is a toxin. It's bad for you no matter what. Now, I personally like to take a calculated risk and I like to indulge modestly in uh, alcoholic beverages within my comfortable limits. And if you are the kind of person that is uh, impressionable or uh, it has a tendency towards overindulging in alcohol or anything really, but in this case alcohol, or if you are not of age, to enjoy alcoholic beverages, then maybe give this video a pass, or at least know that, like I said, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for responsible alcohol consumption, whatever that means in your context. So, um, I don't like to glorify getting drunk or anything like that. I think, you know, a little bit of modest alcohol consumption in the context of like a craft beer a nice wine every once in a while can be a nice thing to enjoy, but uh, I just like to throw it out there that if you're not of age, seriously, like, take your time, there's no rush. You can, you know, enjoy a, a glass of wine or a, a brew or something, uh, you know, eventually when you get there. And uh, if you are of age and you do enjoy your, your alcohol, uh, please consume responsibly, be kind to yourself and kind to those around you. All right, that's my little disclaimer. <laughs> uh, so with that said, let's drink some beer. So I've got three beers here today. I'm going to be drinking them out of these beautiful uh, so-called tulip glasses. Tulip glasses. These are uh, kind of these goblet-like glasses, which I received as a, a gift for Christmas a few years back. They are lovely. And uh, the experts say <laughs> that they're supposed to help, uh, I guess, like, 
focus the, the scent and uh, uh, sort of nose of the beer. Uh, I don't know, something about their shape and easy to drink from. I don't know. I promised this was going to be an unpretentious video, didn't I? I think we already failed <laughs> with the tulip glasses, but whatever. They're lovely glasses. And uh, of these three beers, uh, one is an IPA, an India Pale Ale with a twist. Uh, one is a porter, which is a, a darker style of beer, a dark brown style. And one is a stout, which is an even darker, heavier style of beer. Uh, because we're still technically in the winter season when I'm uh, recording this. I kind of wanted to lean towards those darker beers, which are a little more seasonal. But we are moving into spring, so I thought I would lighten it up a little bit with the IPA here. And I'm going to go in the order of lighter to darker. So, uh, you know, starting with something that's hopefully, presumably, not quite as strong and heavy on the palate, and moving towards the strongest, heaviest one, which is, I think, going to be quite flavorful. You'll find out why when we get there. Or if you take a peek down, I guess, at the timestamps, you know, but... Uh, so, we're going to start off with this guy right here. This is the IPA with the twist that I mentioned. This is the Blackberry Sprout Sprout <laughs> uh, from Mount Aerosmith Brewing. Mount Aerosmith Brewing. Uh, so, Mount Aerosmith Brewing is located in Parksville, British Columbia, which is on Vancouver Island, the island where I live, but it's a little ways away from here, a few hours drive. Uh, nevertheless, I try to make it up that way at least once every summer and uh, enjoy some of their brews and their tap room and restaurant there. And, uh, and that area is just gorgeous, beautiful part, Vancouver Island, if you ever make it out this way. Uh, the Blackberry Sprout is <laughs> quite an interesting assortment of things here. As you can see, it is a spruce tip brute IPA with blackberries. So there's a lot going on there. Let's let's unpack that for a second. So uh, the spruce tip part is exactly what it sounds like. And they brew this beer with uh, the tips of boughs from spruce trees, and they impart a very distinctive resinous kind of piney flavor uh, to the beer. And uh, uh, the Spruce Tip IPA is a style you do see occasionally, especially around these parts uh, from craft breweries uh, out on the west side of the island. Uh, we have lots of Sitka spruce trees. I'm not quite sure what kind of spruce these tips are harvested from, but perhaps it's the Sitka spruce. Um, the brute part, I have to admit, I don't actually know what the brute means. B-R-U-T, brute. Um, I don't know what that refers to in the context of a beer. I've seen it used before, but I'm actually, despite the fact that I enjoy drinking beer, I'm no expert. I'm certainly not a brewer, so everything I've learned is just what I've picked up from tasting beers, you know, and reading the the blurbs on the back here. Uh, and then uh, the IPA part means this is an India Pale Ale, which is a, a category of beers that is known for strong additions of hops. Hops, uh, well, the hop berry is from the hop plant. Uh, and it is, well, it was historically added to beers as a preservative. Uh, back in the olden days when uh, the you know English were sailing around the world claiming far-flung lands in the name of the British Empire, they would need some way to preserve the beer that they uh, shipped off to their colonies. And it just so happens that hops is a really good preservative. So that's why they started heavily hopping 
these ales. And India was one of the chief uh, export locations for this heavily hopped ale. And so that's why today we have the style known as the India IPA, uh, or the India Pale Ale, <laughs> the IPA. <laughs> Uh, that's got these generous additions of hops. And hops can add a lot of flavor to a beer. Chiefly, people know it for adding bitterness, but not always. Hops can also add uh, fruity flavors, like bright citrusy flavors, even melon flavors. They can add floral notes. They can add a greenness, um, a pininess, that could complement that spruce tip uh, profile very well. So, uh, we'll have to see what they've hopped this with, because there's many different varieties of hops. And then the blackberry part is exactly what it sounds like. The spear is also brewed with blackberries, uh, which, uh, of course, you know, bright, free, juicy berries, and uh, could pair really nicely with that greeny, spicy spruciness. I'm just imagining. I guess, again, I've never tried this this particular fruit, but... Uh, on the back here, it says, A Brute IPA with Blackberries. The Sprout, that's of course a Spruce Brute. The Sprout gets a berry boost with the addition of fresh pureed blackberries. Sitka Spruce Tips, there you go. And Cascadian Hops give this beer its signature forest flavor, while the berries enhance the juiciness and color to a new level. Ingredients, water, barley, hops, yeast, and blackberry puree. So, despite all those flavors packed in there, it's a pretty simple ingredients list. And, uh, it's got this lovely can, very pretty. blackberries down here, of course, and the Sitka spruce up here. Uh, I gather these guys make a uh, non-blackberried version of this, just a regular Sprout IPA, um, but uh, this one's just got a little, little extra zing to it with those berries, a little extra sweetness. 6.5% uh, is the alcohol content here, so it's of middling strength. And you can see on here, it's on the lighter side rather than the darker. And in terms of hop content, it's kind of right in the middle. So it shouldn't be too very bitter, but hopefully fairly flavorful. I will not be consuming the whole can because if I drank all of this and the next two beers in one video, I'd be pretty trashed by the end. And what was I talking about earlier? Responsible alcohol enjoyment, so, but we'll do a, a nice little half glass pour here. All right. Um, I will, uh, crack this open, and turn down the volume for you while I do that, so, uh, it doesn't blast your ears out. Get some nice fizz right off the bat. Oh, you can definitely. Oh, that's that is. Oh, you can smell that spruce. That's loaded with spruce and blackberries. Actually, you can really get both right uh, off the off the top there, which is really nice. And what I'm actually going to do is just adjust these microphones a little bit to turn the most sensitive parts towards where I'm going to be pouring, so that you get the best, crispest possible sounding pour and fizz and foam. Okay, let's pour it out. Here we go.
it's got a vigorous fizz there. But it's actually not terribly foamy. It's a... Uh, it's a fairly coarse head. That's what they call the foam on top. The bubbles here are quite coarse and vigorous, and so they're dissipating pretty quickly. Um, leaving just a little bit of lacing on the sides of the glass. But it's mostly, mostly done fizzing already. In some styles, uh, with a, like a higher specific gravity and more viscosity, uh, that foam lingers for a long time, really builds up in big fluffy mounds, but not, not so much here. I'm just going to adjust back the microphones here. Okay, now I sound a little crisper. So, let's take a look at the color. It pours a cloudy, light red to pinkish kind of color. It almost looks like a ruby red grapefruit juice, doesn't it? But uh, that would be, of course, from the pureed blackberry, lending that uh, nice rosiness to the color here. And uh, it's definitely, definitely pretty cloudy. Uh, but like I said, the thing that struck me the most right as soon as I cracked open that can was mm, just how sprucey and juicy this smells. It is just loaded with the heady aroma of spruciness, that foresty scent. And then balanced by the juiciness of the blackberries and the hops. All right, <laughs> enough talking about it. Here we are, 20 minutes into the video or whatever. I haven't even tried a beer yet, so for real, let's uh, let's try this out. Uh, cheers, friends, to pour number one. Wow, holy smokes. That is the spruciest, zestiest beer I think I've ever tried. I've never had a beer with that much spruce flavor loaded into it before. Like I said, it's it's not exactly a common style, the spruce uh, tip IPA, but there are a couple of other breweries in this area that do one, and I've tried them before. I generally like them, but usually that spruce was a more subtle. Uh, whereas here, it is forward. It is right up at the front. It is, uh, like, it kind of punches you in the face. Like, it's got a zestiness to it that almost verges on lemonish, like lemony, but more of a piney, resinous kind of piney element to it. It is very fresh tasting. And a very complex flavor profile because you've got the spruce up front, you've got uh, a lingering uh, bitterness after that, where the hops, those Cascadia hops come in, and then a sweetness that balances all out from the blackberries. It is a delightful combination, I have to say. Uh, I like Mount Aerosmith Brewing, like I said, I. I enjoy their stuff, but uh, this, you know, even knowing that they, they put out some good stuff, this is uh, surprisingly excellent. Uh, it's got a fairly dry finish, despite so much juicy flavor. Uh, it does have a fairly dry finish. Um, and I think this would be a fantastic beer, you know, for sipping in the summertime because it does have that juiciness and it is so refreshing, but it also works great as a shoulder season kind of beer as well, spring or fall. Uh, it's not necessarily like a wintry flavor profile, which in my mind is characterized by heavier, darker beers, sweeter flavors, 
Um, but, uh, I mean, you could enjoy this, of course, any time of year. <laughs> Doesn't really matter. I promised this would be unpretentious. And here I've, <laughs> I think I failed in that. I've been rambling on and on about beer styles and all these fancy additions. And if this sounds totally foreign to you, maybe you just know beer from, you know, a, a lager, like a Bud Light or something like that. That's uh, sort of your point of contact with beer. Or maybe, maybe you don't drink beer at all, or you've only ever tried it a couple of times. If what I'm describing here sounds kind of wild, that's because it is. Like, there, the craft brewing world has just exploded over the last decade or so. And uh, there are so many fascinating and just very different kinds of beers out there. All these different styles from all over the world. And people are more experimental than ever with what they're adding to the beer. The flavors they're combining and experimenting with. And so, if you have this conception that beer is only ever just light lagers, I encourage you to go and try something different. Just try something weird and wacky at a local brewery. Just something that strikes your fancy. Uh, sounds interesting. You might be surprised what you find. Uh, this is certainly surprising even for me as someone who, you know, drinks a lot of local beers. Um, you know, a wide variety. So, It's very lively on the tongue. Uh, the the bubbles are, I wouldn't say it's like super heavily carbonated, but they're sharp. You know, it adds to that, that sharpness and freshness. Yeah, this is, this is really good. I'll have to keep my eyes open for this again in the future. I'm pretty sure they only put it out for the first time last year. I think this was a last fall beer. I wonder if it coincided with the blackberry season, uh, which uh, in this part of the world is sort of August, uh, is when the blackberries are really in full swing, like late August. And uh, blackberries around here are, are what we call the Himalayan blackberry, um, Arubus armeniacus. And it is an invasive species, so it's not native to this part of the world, but it is naturalized here, which is to say it's never leaving. <laughs> uh, it is a very, uh, actually a very aggressive colonizer of uh, disturbed areas, so sites where the soil has been um, churned up. And uh, it is one of those things where Technically speaking, technically speaking, it's not so great for the local ecology, but people don't mind it too much because it does produce these delicious, delicious berries every season. And, uh, you know, growing up, one of my favorite things in the late summer was going and picking blackberries uh, along the roadside. You often find blackberries growing uh, along road cuts and, and banks, because um, again, those disturbed areas, it, it colonizes there quite readily. Uh, I was lucky enough to grow up kind of out in the country. We had a small acreage and uh, we had a couple of blackberry patches on the property, uh, which would yield tons and tons of blackberries. We'd pick, you know, ice cream pails full and uh, freeze them, you know, for baking pies and all that kind of stuff. I still enjoy going out and picking blackberries every summer. <laughs> um, when I was a kid, I could never understand how my parents could like fill up their buckets so quickly. Uh, I felt like it took me forever to actually fill up like a little bucket or basket. But I think it's just because I just ate a lot of the berries. I think it's because not many of them actually made it into my bucket. Uh, but 
Hey, how can you not when they're so delicious? <laughs> Yeah, definitely like a lemony brightness and then that spruciness nicely balanced by that berry sweetness. And the hops are there, they're present, but honestly, it's the spruce and blackberry that are the stars of this show. And you, usually a heavily hopped variety like an IPA is very hop forward. That's the primary flavor component that you notice. But uh, because the additions the spruce and the blackberry are so, you know, boldly flavored in their own right. Um, they really do sort of um, uh, sit up at the, the forefront of the flavor profile. The hops are there. They're nicely blended, but they're not right at the front. This was maybe a slightly more generous pour than I had intended. Um, I just, I honestly, I was pouring it out there and I was like, you know, oh yeah, we'll just, you know, fill it up. And I'm like, oh wait, right. We're doing taster pours here. Taster pours. But that's okay. I don't have anywhere to be after this. Except bed. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we're here to relax, so. We're almost on this one. For their part, the hops are a bit citrusy, a little bit grapefruity, honestly, um, and they blend really nicely with that spruce, some bright, almost citrusy spruce flavor. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna keep an eye out for more of this. It's, uh, it's quite unique. Uh, as I said, I've never had any, anything with this strong, uh, a spruciness before. It's just loaded and, but, and it could become overbearing, you know, it could be overbearing, but that sweetness of the blackberries really balances it out nicely and rounds it out in a way where you don't feel like it's you're getting just hammered with the spruce on the palate with each sip. It adds that complexity that, you know, you get the spruce up front, the sweetness on the finish, it kind of the sweetness lingers and the aroma of the blackberries lingers. And then that primes you to come back for more of that spruciness. It's, it's very, it's very good. Really, really well done. A very refreshing brew, for sure. Man, I gotta hold off from just drinking that whole thing right now. <laughs> and it won't go to waste. I do have little silicone, uh, silicone um, covers that I can put over this and I can save it for tomorrow night, for example, uh, in the fridge. Open beer in the fridge is usually good for a few days if you can seal it. Um, it's never quite as good as when you open it fresh, but, um, certainly it's, it's totally drinkable for a few days anyway, if you've got a seal on it. These cans, these tall cans, are about 500 milliliters, I think. Uh, 473, yeah, so it's, you know, this is a, a standard kind of, uh, beer packaging around these parts. Um, used to be and then we had a lot of bottles around here, but now bottles are very uncommon actually. And I think it's because cans are just cheaper to produce or to use uh, for the breweries, whether it's the assembly line mechanism for canning the beer or the cost of the product itself. I'm not sure. Um, you know, the cans themselves, the packaging itself, but I guess if there's anyone out there watching who is part of this industry, the alcohol industry, the craft beer industry, maybe you could let me know what the reason for the switch towards cans has been in the last five-ish years. Five plus years ago, it was mostly bottled, I would say, at least here 
at least here. And when I say bottles, I generally mean this size of bottle, <laughs> big bottles. This is what we call a bomber, the size of a bottle. And it is 650 mils. So it's a good, you know, third again, more than uh, the volume in these cans. And for that reason, actually, the cans are a bit more practical too. You're much more likely to finish a can in a single sitting, whereas the bomber is a lot to, you know, finish in one go. It's quite a bit of beer for me, at least. Um, and that's why we don't see many of these bottles. But I did find this bottle at the liquor store the other day, and I had to get it because I really like, I like beer in bottles. I like uh, the sound. I like the taste. Something about a glass bottle. It's really nice. So this is our second beer for today, and it is from a uh, local, uh, regular, uh, no, that's the wrong term, whatever, a, a very well-known local brewery. That's Phillips Brewing and Malting, and uh, Phillips is definitely a uh, Victoria staple. Um, they brew lots and lots of beers that make it out to lots and lots of restaurants in the region and uh, further afield as well around the Pacific Northwest. They're quite well known and um, they are good. Um, uh, you know, most of their stuff is really, really solid. Some people would call them a bit mid, maybe, <laughs> these days. <laughs> but those, I, I want to say those people are maybe a bit snobbier uh, than I like to be. Um, you know, they have some stuff that's that's pretty okay. They have some stuff that's really, really good. Uh, but they've been doing it for a long time. And they, they always do have some fresh, new, and interesting stuff to try. And uh, they're based out of Victoria, British Columbia. And uh, uh, this one here is new to me. This is the Heavy Pedal Porter. Heavy Pedal. And so we've got this heavy metal bicycle theme going on here, which is actually really fun. We've got like a skull thing with like a bike chain around it, a kind of motif, and then a skeleton uh, cycling on a bike w with wheels that look like pentagrams. Uh, what else is going on there? I don't know, probably some other very metal looking stuff. Got like bat wings up on the corners here. HP heavy paddle. Uh, that's pretty fun. Uh, Victoria is a city that likes its bicycles and it is moving more and more towards being very bike friendly. Lots of bike lanes, dedicated bike bicycle lanes being installed, uh, you know, especially in the downtown core to make it more bikeable. They are controversial, let's say. <laughs> Uh, you know, cyclists like them, but, uh, sometimes drivers find them infuriating because they, they can, you know, cause traffic backups and they're, you know, removing parking spaces and, yeah, <laughs> it's the whole thing. <laughs> we don't have to get into that here because you guys don't care about Victoria, BC's, uh, bike lane controversies, but, uh, what you might care about is... What the heck is in this beer? It says live free, live free. Uh, it doesn't actually tell us much about it. It just says it's a porter, which as I described is a darker style of beer, uh, usually made with a browned toasted malt, not usually, always. That's the defining characteristic of a porter. So, um, They've been toasted. You get that nice uh, roasty flavor and aroma. You get the darker color of the beer from those malts. Um, some would say that porters are like one step down on the darkness heaviness scale. And then you go one beyond that, you end up at the stout. Stout porters were originally what they called just the heavier porters. Uh, back in the 1800s until eventually 
they just kind of became their own style, known as stouts. But I do have a stout here, which I'll be trying after this. Um, but honestly, many craft breweries these days use porter and stout pretty interchangeably. You can have really dark, heavy porters uh, that are just as heavy as any stout. But you can also have lighter ones uh, that are a little more caramelly, sort of browned malts rather than really dark, toasty malts. And when I say malts, I mean the, the grains, the barley grain that is used in the fermentation of a beer. Um, one of the principal uh, ingredients in the beer, along with like the water and the hops and the yeast in a, you know, in a conventional pure beer. Uh, just trying to see if there's anything else kind of fun going on here. So let's ride here. It says here contains malted barley. Okay. <laughs> As one might expect. Phillips Brewing and Malting Company. Victoria, BC. I drive past these guys pretty often. And, uh, they've got a nice little cap there. It says... Phillips has their logo on it. Okay. Shall we try this? I'm not sure when they introduced this style or this um this particular beer. I had never seen it before on the shelves, so perhaps fairly recently. Let's pop it open. Satisfying snap hiss. Mmm, definitely, definitely toasty. Definitely you can smell those toasted malts. Uh, and for this, I'm going to use a fresh glass. I don't want to cross-contaminate. Is that pretentious of me? Probably. But uh, hey, we're doing a tasting here. We have to have some standards. <laughs> Once again, I'm going to adjust the mics. All right, so hopefully we get a nice, nice sound from this pour. Let's start on this ear this time, because I think I started over here last time. So let's pour one out. for the sound, but this is already getting pretty full, this glass, so. It occurs to me the way I've set up these mics, you can't really see me pouring the beer. You can just hear it. I hope that's not upsetting to you. Maybe I should have moved them up a little more so you could see the pour a little bit better. But at least you get the nice crisp sound. Um, and this one was actually a very quiet pour, a quiet pour, and that is probably because it is a, a much more viscous beer, uh, it'll have a smoother mouth feel, and for that reason, uh, it's not as bright and effervescent, right? Uh, and you might notice that despite that, despite it being a little more viscous, uh, we didn't get all that much foam, but the foam that is there is definitely thicker. We get this nice, what they call, lacing on the sides as the foam recedes from the sides of the glass. You get a nice kind of, you know, trails of foam. It's kind of a light tan. There's an ivory, pretty close to white, Let's say an ivory color on that, that head. But yeah, not a whole lot of it. It did recede pretty quickly. 
Okay, I'm gonna adjust back these mics. I'm a little surprised because typically these more viscous beers do build up those kind of mounds of very fluffy looking foam. Um, but I, I poured pretty slowly. And so, <laughs> sprucey, <laughs> that, uh, that does make for usually less foam buildup, you know. But yeah, lovely, lovely lacing on sides there. Uh, the color of the pour is a deep, deep brown. Not quite black, but a very dark, chocolatey looking brown like a caramelly at the edges where I get a bit more light through. It's definitely got a caramel brown kind of tone. On the nose, it is definitely uh, toasty. Um, I wouldn't say like deep, deep, rich chocolatey notes necessarily. But, uh, but definitely a toasty roastiness. Anyway, let's try it out. Cheers to more new beer adventures. Okay, so, um, that's actually much lighter on the palate than I expected. Um, and it is, like I said, it's a porter it's not a stout, so, um, and that actually does explain why we didn't get probably more of that rich foam buildup, because despite, despite having a fairly roasty, uh, toasted malt kind of, uh, scent to it, aroma, it's, it's pretty light. It's not got a really thick, smooth mouthfeel like a porter might. Um, And it's very nicely balanced, really. Um, this is what I would say uh, is a very sessionable uh, porter. Uh, sessionable is just like fancy beer speak way of saying you could drink a lot of this without feeling like really bogged down or like overwhelmed with flavor. Uh, sometimes, you know, the uh, heavier beers, or those really flavorful, full-bodied beers, it can be a lot, like, and you, you can get through a glass or a pint, and then that's enough, you know, you've had, you've had enough, uh, your palate gets tired, or you just get full, especially with, like, the heavy stouts, where it can be, like, <laughs> like, drinking liquid bread, you know, uh, like very, very heavy, very thick, um, but this porter is, is really quite light on the tongue. And really, um, just pleasant. It's not, it's not a very opinionated porter, if that makes sense. Like, it doesn't have a whole lot going on to like, distinguish it from other porters, I guess. Um, and nor does it claim to. You know, it's not got anything added to it. It's not got any, you know, coffee or chocolate or anything added to it. Sometimes you get, you know, spiced porters or vanilla porters or all kinds of flavors that uh, brewers experiment with in terms of additions. But this, this is a very pure, straightforward, no nonsense, nicely balanced porter. Um, and for that reason, I think it is very drinkable. Uh, you could happily, you know, spend an evening uh, sipping on this. And I don't think you would feel too overloaded, you know, too uh, bogged down by it. I actually did not look at the alcohol percentage. I don't think it's that high because it doesn't, I don't get any 
booziness on the palate or any of that, that warmth, uh, it's 5.5%. So that's very typical. Very typical for a, a uh, craft beer. Um, and again, that makes it a little easier drinking, something you could have more of if you wanted. Again, I advocate for responsible alcohol consumption, but, uh, you know, if you were to polish off this bomber over the course of a, an evening, uh, I don't think you would feel like you, you overdid it, for example, or at least I wouldn't, but everybody's different. So leaving these lovely, lovely patterns on the side of the glass. Um, and this would be a fantastic beer for somebody who does not like hops <laughs> because uh, it's very malt forward as porters tend to be. Uh, so the majority, the predominant flavor is uh, those roasty kind of toasted malts um, with a bit of chocolatiness to them, a little bit of breadiness, um, but it's a very mellow flavor on the palate. It's not super bitter. It's not super sweet either, but it's definitely not high on the bitterness scale. Uh, and uh, I find generally that people who uh, don't like beer, it's often because of the bitterness, often because of the hops. Because those hops, again, can't add a lot of bitterness and sort of this pungent edge um, that people often don't like, uh, especially if they're just getting into, you know, uh, trying out craft craft beers. Um, and so, you know, when people who are sort of just starting to experiment with different kinds of beers ask me, you know, what's a good starting point, I'm almost never going to say, oh, try an IPA. Uh, I'm almost always going to say, try a nice crisp, balanced lager, <laughs> or try a nice mellow brown ale or lighter porter like this. I think this would be fantastic for somebody uh, who likes those darker, kind of toastier aspects of beer, but is wanting to like really dive into the deep end <laughs> with all kinds of weird flavors or get into the really hoppy stuff. And like I was saying earlier, Phillips is kind of good at that. They're good at making mm, mm, beers with a wide appeal, um, which maybe sounds kind of like a like a backhanded compliment. It's not really meant to be. Uh, it's just what they like to do. Um, and, you know, they've been very successful with it. If you ever come to Victoria or this area, like the vast majority of restaurants uh, will serve Blue Buck, which is a, a Phillips ale, uh, Blue Buck ale, uh, really famous for a reason, because it's just extremely drinkable. Again, some people might say it's just kind of boring, but you know what? I will always enjoy a Blue Buck. Uh, it's just a good, solid workhorse kind of beer. And I, you know, I would prefer it over um, some kind of import lager or something like that. Uh, it's just a little more flavorful. It's local. I like to support the local, local breweries. Uh, this was, again, a very generous pour. <laughs> I probably, probably should have poured less. But I wanted to make sure you guys got some nice sound, some nice fizz going on. Definitely have to take it easy on the last beer here for more reasons than one. Uh, again, I keep hinting at this. It's it's a it's going to be an interesting one. It's a style I've never tried before. As we're getting down to the bottom, you might be able to see that. Well. I was going to say, but the brownness a little more. It doesn't look quite so black. Sort of caramel brown. Maybe not. I don't know. If 
I put a light behind it and shined it through. You can probably see it better, but... Oh, well. I kind of said that we were going to talk about video games here, didn't I? But we have not talked about video games at all. Uh, I don't know what I had in mind. I guess I was going to say uh, a couple of months ago, back in January, I put out a video of my top 10 most anticipated games of 2024, uh, like I do every year. And uh, in that video, I only allowed myself to put games on the list if they had an announced 2024 release date. Um, and so that sort of limited my options. Since then, however, we've had a couple of, or a few different um, direct style presentations from all the major companies, actually. We got uh, some big stuff from Xbox. Uh, we got some big stuff from Nintendo. Um, we got some big stuff from PlayStation as well, you know, in terms of announcements and uh, dates, you know, many more games dated uh, for a 2024 release. And so I kind of wish I had held off on that video, or maybe I'll need to do a follow-up. But more more likely what'll happen is I will do a, a, um, a video sort of midway through the year, um, like around what would have once been the E3 season. Now, I guess the Summer Games Fest season, like around early to mid-July, or June, pardon me. Um, I guess mid-June, uh, when all the manufacturers or all the major console players and publishers are coming out with, uh, you know, their big reveals for new games, um, as well as showing off more of games they've already announced. And around that time, I usually talk about the games that I'm most excited for out of that. So perhaps that'll be my follow-up. All right, let's finish this off just a little bit more. Again, a really nice beer for sipping and chatting. Very good. Okay. Well then. We have one beer left here. And it's a pretty interesting looking one, I have to say. Uh, and it is this one right here. The... Chili Chocolate Milk Stout from Trois Dogs Brewing. Uh, Trois Dogs is a brewery and distillery uh, that is actually of these breweries the closest to where I live. It's not that far away at all, as a matter of fact. And yet, I've actually had very few of their beers over the years. And I think that was partly because I, I had one of their beers some years back and it was, it was fine, but it was nothing to write home about. You know, it was a bit mid, uh, at least in my opinion. Um, and their regular line of, of beers that they offer are just not that exciting or inspiring, at least historically. But it seems like maybe, maybe they're getting a little bit more uh, experimental now, trying out some, some different interesting flavor combinations. And, um, this is certainly one of them, or it looks like it, anyway, it looks to be. Um, I've never had a chili chocolate milk stout before. Um, and once again, there's, there's a lot going on here, so let's, let's break it down a little bit. So, uh, first of all, what, what is a milk stout? Well, as I was explaining earlier, a stout is a very dark style of beer, very full-bodied. It is sort of the darkest end of the spectrum, um, and it's like a, a very dark, heavy porter. Um, and so it's, you know, even further down that roasted, toasted, malts kind of path than uh, the heavy pedal porter that I just had. And a uh, milk stout 
is a stout that has had lactose added to it. Lactose being a sugar derived from milk. And um, lactose uh, is not digested, not fermented by uh, beer yeasts. And so it is left behind in the beer where the other sugars are fermented into alcohol. The lactose is left behind and it, it adds a sweetness and a smoothness to the beer. And uh, it adds to the um, sort of the, the heaviness and viscosity of the beer in its mouthfeel as well. And historically, uh, milk stouts were actually um, marketed as being very uh, nutritious. Um, and they were marketed towards uh, young mothers uh, or new mothers who are breastfeeding. <laughs> Um, they are supposed to stimulate uh, milk production, apparently. Um, I don't think there's any science to back that up. <laughs> and I do not think that these days doctors would recommend milk stouts to breastfeeding mothers. Nevertheless, that uh, is part of their history. And, uh, you know, for many years they kind of went out of style. Um, but in more recent years, uh, they've been sort of revived by uh, a number of craft breweries because they are a very decadent, very full-bodied, uh, smooth mouthfeel kind of stout. Uh, many dessert beers end up as you know milk stouts for that reason. The chili chocolate part is, of course, adding another layer to. Uh, the flavor profile here. Uh, the chocolatiness that's common with milk stouts. You often see uh, you know, chocolate, uh, or caramel, or vanilla milk stouts, all those flavors that um, not only go well with uh, the uh, richness of a milk stout, but also tend to just naturally come out of those uh, toasted, roasted malts. Um, pardon me, this is the challenge with uh, drinking carbonated beverages in a video. Um, but um, also just, yeah, it really works well, right? Flavor-wise. Um, but the chili part, the chili part is what caught my attention. And I know that chili and chocolate is kind of a combo that you see sometimes. Like, I think you can get, just, you can buy chocolate at the grocery store, like chili chocolate. That's like spicy and sweet. I've never done that before, so I've never tried it. Um, but uh, they're doing that in the beer, I guess, with this. Um, and it, it kind of has like, almost like a, like a Central American vibe to it, you know, like... I don't know, it makes me think of like the Aztecs or the Maya or something like that. Because I think, well, I don't know for sure, but I feel like historically that's where that flavor combination came from. I could be wrong. Um, anyway, all that is to say that uh, I've never had a spicy beer before. And so I'm very interested by this. And I'm a little, a little bit suspicious of it. I'm not sure what a spicy milk stout is going to be like. Um, but it says here, chili heat. And, uh, what does it say? Dark chocolate. Chili heat and dark chocolate. 6.5% ABV, so a little bit on the stronger side like our spruce tip ale, actually. And uh, kind of a weird flavor combination for a brewery that is ostensibly Scottish, huh? It's not the first thing you think of when you think Scottish <laughs> beer. <laughs> but there it is, Twa Dogs Chili Chocolate Milk Stout. Uh, so Twa Dogs is the brewery. Um, McCallany's Distillery is the uh, whiskey distillery there. 
has her seal on the back. It says here, Delicious and smooth, our milk stout is brewed with a cacao nibs and lactose, giving it a rich, velvety feel on the palate. Chilies are added twice during the brewing process to establish a subtle, lingering heat which slowly builds as you enjoy your pint. These complex flavors are built over a well-balanced foundation of roasted malts and oats. Indulge yourself with this exquisite and unique brew. Uh, ingredients are oats. So that's another common addition to uh, stouts, um, especially if you want one with a, a really smooth mouthfeel and a high viscosity. Oats are commonly added to beers to, to give you that smooth mouthfeel and a little bit of cloudiness or haziness usually. Uh, oats, wheat, lactose, chili oil, and cacao nibs. Uh, in addition to, you know, your typical beer ingredients, barley and all that. Uh, so the chili oil, I guess, is where that that spiciness comes from. Uh, shall we? Yeah, let's try it out. Why not? Okay, we'll crack this open. There we go. Adjust the mics once more. Okay. Mm. It smells like a nice dark stout, but you can't really smell the spiciness. So, but let's pour it out. Try to use some restraint with that pour. And now this one, this one did pour a nice, rich, foamy head, as you can see. It's a light tan. And, uh, you know, it is receding, but you can see that, especially if I had gone for a full pour, we would have quite a lot of head on there. Nice fluffy mounds of it. Definitely leaves behind some some viscous lacing on the sides there. And again, that's going to be because it is a thick beer. Especially with the addition of those oats. They're going to really Amp up that viscosity. Look how long it takes for that foam to slowly slide down the side of the side of the uh, glass there. And uh, it is dark, unlike the porter that we had, where I could see a bit of sort of that brown caramelly color on the edges. This is like pitch black. <laughs> it's like dark as the night. Um, and, uh, very creamy looking, very creamy looking on top. Mm, so, yeah, I mean, the scent is, uh, very dark roasty. Um, not actually quite as strong as the porter 
Uh, it's it's a little more subdued. But deep chocolate. Dark chocolatey scent. Um, okay, we'll try this, but first, I'm gonna readjust the mics for the last time. Okay. Last one. Shall we? Cheers, my friends, to hanging out with me here while I try out some beers, ramble a little bit. I appreciate you. I appreciate you being here with me. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Cheers. That is very smooth. Very, very smooth. Definitely chocolatey. Not getting any chili spiciness just yet. It is a lovely velvety mouthfeel though. It's heavy. Unlike the porter, which we had previously, I had previously, which we, you know, we looked at previously. Um, this is not what I would call sessionable. This is definitely a, a beer that demands your attention. And uh, it's not the kind of thing that you would just drink, you know, a large quantity of over the course of an evening. This beer is a, an event, you know. You have to pay attention to it. It's got a subtle sweetness, probably from the, the lactose addition, but I wouldn't say it has any like vanilla notes or anything like that. It is firmly within the dark chocolate coffee end of the spectrum. It's definitely got a a coffiness to it. Still not really getting the spiciness. But we'll keep going. They do claim it builds. It builds. I have to wonder if they're adding chili oil, how does it, how do they prevent it from separating, right? You think the oil and the beer would separate out and you'd end up with a bunch of chili oil on the top, but it um, doesn't seem to be the case. I don't see anything like that on there. Maybe when you pour it, it mixes. And okay, so I'm actually not getting the spiciness in the mouth, really, but I can feel it, like, in my throat slightly. But it's very mild. It's just a warmth, really. It's a warmth in my throat. A little tingle on the tongue, but, like, extremely mild. And I'm not, like, a spice fiend. I'm not the kind of person who seeks out really spicy foods. I like a bit of spice. But, I'm not out to prove anything. <laughs> it's a very pleasing milk stout. Like I said, very smooth. Um, it's got, I would say, almost more... Almost more of a coffee element than a chocolate element. You know, they call it a chocolate chili chocolate milk stout, but it's definitely got some of that coffee flavor. It's not brewed with coffee. You know, certainly there are many coffee stouts, nitro stouts and whatnot, uh, that are brewed with coffee. Um, but also, okay, actually I'm starting to, okay, I'm getting a little bit of the spiciness on the tongue. It does build. It does build. Interesting. Um, 
but that that coffee flavor profile does kind of just come out of uh, dark roasted malts just naturally. Yeah, I, I'm definitely getting a little bit of spiciness. I don't dislike it. It's different, for sure. Spicy and beer aren't normally two things that I put together, you know, in my head. But, um... It works, it works with this style of beer, again, because it's such a heavy, viscous, full-bodied, smooth milk stout. It, it kind of works with the spiciness. If this was some other style, like a brighter, you know, fresher flavor, I feel like that wouldn't balance out so well, right? It's nice. Yeah, it's nice. I would say for something different, it's a really nice departure from the usual. And I would say that if you're looking for a beer that uh, is interesting and, like I said, kind of demands your attention, sort of a centerpiece beer, if that makes sense, where you're, you know, you're drinking it because you want to know what it's like, try it out. I think it's really, I think it's quite good. But it's definitely not the kind of thing that you would drink casually at a D&D session or something. Uh, it's heavy, for one, so, you, you know, you're not gonna... It's not very sessionable, right? You're gonna tire, I think, of it. Your palate is gonna tire. You're gonna get full really quickly with this. Um, and that spiciness is starting to build. I don't know if it gets to the point of being uncomfortable by the end of the can? I don't think so. It is very subtle. It's just a, you know, it's just a tingle, just a little bit of heat. Pretty much any spicy food you might eat is going to be spicier than this. Pardon me. Sriracha sauce, like Frank's Red Hot, definitely way spicier than this. <laughs> but um, but you wouldn't want a whole lot of spice in your beer anyway. That would get, I think, weird pretty quick. And it is building. I can feel it, sort of that spicy tingle mounting on my tongue. Uh... And it's pleasant. It is it's, it's quite unique. It's very different. I found this at the liquor store, um, just looking for interesting beers. Um, and interestingly enough, I found another uh, chili uh, chocolate beer from a different local brewery. Uh, and I was tempted to get them both, do a little compare and contrast, but exercise restraint <laughs> and I, I just got this one um, but it's, it's pretty good it's pretty good but it's a lot again it's, it's very heavy the stout's quite a quite a heavy beer all right last sip here we go bottoms up And that, my friends, is that. A fun and interesting kind of novelty beer, I would say. Um, but um, I'm glad I tried it. I'm glad I tried it. And now maybe I'll go back to the liquor store and uh, pick up that other one from that other brewery. It's from a brewery called Howell Brewing. Howell Brewing, which is a very small uh, little indie brewery 
uh, in the area. They brew all kinds of weird, like very strange things. Uh, quite unique combinations of stuff from Howl Brewing. But this one from Twa Dogs, pretty good. Pretty good. Definitely um, more interesting than the last Twa Dogs beer I tried. This one from Phillips, the Heavy Pedal. Not all that interesting, I have to admit. Not bad, just not particularly interesting. But a really tasty, sessionable, light porter. Great if you're into those uh, toasty, malty flavors, but don't want something heavy. Um, but for me, for as far as I'm concerned, uh, the winner of tonight's three beers is definitely the Blackberry Sprout from Mount Aerosmith Brewing. Uh, this one was a real surprise. Uh, it was incredibly flavorful, uh, like just heaping helpings of that Sitka spruce in there. Um, really nicely balanced with that blackberry sweetness and just expertly blended with that hop lushness and juiciness. Uh, really, really impressed with the blackberry sprout. So uh, not that I'm giving out awards here. <laughs> That's not what this is about. But if you want my, my take on it, uh, I think if I'm, if I'm ranking these, I'm going to go Blackberry Sprout at number one. Uh, Twa Dogs Chili Chocolate Milk Stout at number two. And Phillips Heavy Petal coming in at a number three. But they're all pretty good. I would drink all of them again. So that's a pretty good litmus test, I guess. <laughs> um... Of course, these are just three styles and three particular products of, like, a, just a vast array of options uh, in the craft beer world. Uh, from, you know, uh, sours to um, wheat beers to Belgian style to, uh, you know, lagers and uh, brown ales and, and porters. Uh, you know, stouts, and everything in between, IPAs, amber ales. There's so many options. I didn't even get started on the barrel-aged beers these days. Barrel-aged beers are all the rage right now. Lots of bourbon barrel-aged stuff or oak barrel-aged stuff that has some of that tannic kind of whininess to it. There's just so many different kinds of beers. Or, you know, nice chill, beachy lagers. Whatever your heart desires in the beer world, you can pretty much find it. So, uh, I don't know what point I'm trying to make other than, I guess, if you've been hesitant to, uh, you know, try different kinds of beers, but you are interested, see what's out there. Go find some local craft breweries. You don't have to stick to, you know, the big international brands and the, the loggers or whatever. There's so much uh, fascinating stuff out there. And craft breweries are, you know, popping up all over the place. I feel like every, you know, major urban area, and even, at least in this part of the world, many smaller communities have at least one brewery. Um, but certainly major urban areas have many, many, craft breweries, uh, the worldwide, you know, all around, so, um, go check it out, but drink responsibly, know your limit, <laughs> uh, and, uh, don't overdo it, um, but enjoy it in moderation, responsibly, uh, these craft brews can be a really fun adventure into all kinds of interesting flavors that you might not otherwise experience. Speaking of interesting things that you might not otherwise experience, man, this polo, huh? It's been really comfy this whole time. <laughs> so comfy, I kind of forgot I was wearing a polo. But a uh, big shout out to this video sponsor, Into the AM. Once again, they of the elevated everyday apparel. Of course, known for their graphic tees. Really fun, really beautiful. Go check out their new designs over on their website. They're getting new ones every month. In fact, they sent over some new ones quite recently. You will no doubt see those 
in a future video, maybe some future live streams, quite likely. Um, but also check out their polos and all of their other awesome apparel. All of it's super comfy, all of it's super easy to care for, and all of it for 10% off if you use that link down below in the video description. Go check it out. Uh, my friends, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you to those of you who requested another beer tasting. Like I said at the beginning, it has been kind of too long since I did one here on the YouTube channel. So, uh, I was happy to do one, and I hope you enjoyed it very much. Thank you so much for joining me, friends, and I look very forward my knee looks very forward uh, to having you here next time. Farewell for now. But wait, there's more. I hope you didn't think I was ending the video without our special thanks. This is the part of the video where I give thanks to our amazing channel supporters, those kind folks who go over and above to support what I do here and ensure that I can keep making the kind of content that I love the most and that hopefully you love watching and listening to the most as well. You can see their illustrious names laid out here before your eyes and if you, dear viewer or listener, would like to join the ranks of these incredible individuals, you can find links down below in the video description to my Patreon and my YouTube memberships. There you will find three different tiers, each with increasingly awesome fun perks, starting at the Foos tier, where you get your name on this special thanks page, as well as early access to my weekend videos. At the Fus Row tier, you get that, plus every month you get to vote in a poll where you select the topic of a video here on the channel. Have some say over uh, what you get to see here. And finally, at the Fus Row tier, you get all of the above, plus an extra special spoken thank you every single video. Big ol' shout out. And it is my great honor to read to you the names of our Fusro Da tier patrons and YouTube members, supporters, one might say, for this month or this video. <laughs> Starting with Ragnar Ragnarsson, Smitty, Odinson, K Time. Drummer Brit, Rango Steel, and Jake Luffney. Amazing folks. I cannot thank them enough for their kind support, whether on Patreon or YouTube memberships. And that goes for everybody that you see here. Once again, if you would like to get these fun perks and support what I do here, please consider clicking on through all those links down below in the video description. Once again, a big, big thank you to our amazing channel supporters. <laughs>